Hi, good afternoon everyone. I'm Jason Marzak. I'm the uh, Deputy Director of the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center here at the Atlantic Council and thank you all so much for joining for actually what is a very uh, momentous occasion is the first ever Google Hangout that the uh, Adrian Arts Latin America Center is, is doing. For those of you who might not be familiar with, with the Latin America Center, we are housed within the Atlantic Council, which is one of the preeminent uh, think tanks, foreign policy think tanks here in Washington with a global footprint. The Latin America Center, we, we started two years ago with the idea of talking about the transformations that are occurring throughout Latin America uh, and why Latin America needs to be increasingly thought of as a political and economic and social partner uh, for the US, Europe and the broader global community. So we like to really focus on those innovations and transformations that are happening across the region and when you look across the region one country that in particular is showing um, a lot of innovation is Mexico, um, not only uh, insofar as uh, how policy is being changed at a, at a federal level, um, but, but really insofar as the innovators themselves in Mexico. Uh, people, like, um, people like Pablo Salazar, Pedro Moreno, and people like Marcos Dantes, who is, who is one of the leaders in, insofar as being able to uh, uh, fund these innovations. So this is what we're doing today. This in this hangout. This is we're focusing on health as part of, in this hangout. This is the first in our series of hangouts. We'll be doing another one in January. So I hope you can join us for that. These hangouts are leading to a publication that is being authored by Arturo Franco, uh, very well known uh, in the field of innovation, that we're going to be releasing at a conference in Mexico City on April fifth, twenty sixteen. So save the date. Uh, if you're in Mexico City, hope you can join us. If you're not, hope you can travel to Mexico City to join us. The way we're going to do this is uh, uh, Marcus will speak first. He'll speak for about 10 minutes uh, to give an overview on innovation entrepreneurship. We'll then open up to questions. You can either submit your questions via the Google platform or via Twitter. And then after the uh, round of questions, we'll then have uh, Pablo and Hugo talk about their personal stories and experience in innovation, then open up to more questions. Uh, we'll let, we'll, this will go uh, for about an hour total and hope you can stay with us throughout. So to start off, um, please, t and, and, and as well, if you have t questions that you want to tweet, please tweet those questions to wow. AC Innovation MX. And before handing it over to our speakers, I also want to thank our funder in this, which is Deloitte, and our many partners in this in this uh, in this uh, hangout, which includes Startup Mexico, Ashoka, Partners in Health, Fundación Idea, Results for Development, the Institute of the Americas, and Miami University's uh, Miami Institute for the Americas. So starting off with Marcus, Marcus, is, Marcus Dantes is a renowned serial entrepreneur, an angel investor with two decades of experience creating, managing, funding, and mentoring startups in Mexico as well as the United States. Marcus is currently the CEO and co-founder of Startup Mexico, the first entrepreneurship super campus in Mexico. And when, in Marcus's free time, which I don't really think there's much of, but in that free time, he's also a visiting professor on entrepreneurship and innovation. Marcus has a, 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 a presentation to share with us, so I'm going to turn it over to Marcus. Perfect. Thank you very much for the, for the invitation. And, um, and I'm sorry, my voice is uh, a little bit gone from the weekend uh, in, in San Miguel, so I hope you can hear me all right. Um, you guys are seeing the, the, the first chart, right? Yes. So the, I start like this because this chart is by the OCDE uh, and it basically tells that Mexico, out of all the countries that they monitor, is the country that actually has the largest percentage of new businesses as a total of the, as, a, as the total base of businesses in Mexico. So in Mexico we already have this chip of creating new companies. Um, the problem that we have is that these companies don't necessarily transcend and become large companies and they usually become either lifestyle companies or just self-employment for people. So there's an incredible opportunity for education, uh, for educating these uh, entrepreneurs into creating and growing these companies and showing them how their companies can be more relevant and how they could transcend. The second chart, uh, again by the OCD, is a, is a chart that shows that Mexico is the country that works the most hours of any country in the world, and the Mexicans. 
And immediately when I show this, what comes to mind is that, uh, you know, there's an efficiency problem, a productivity problem, and that is true. But here again, I think there's a great opportunity for educating Mexicans into how to properly use this time, how to become more efficient. Um, and we're starting with a great base because we are not afraid of work. Uh, if we could work more efficiently, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's not that hard to do. Finally, um, there's creativity. Mexicans are very creative. And they have a way of solving problems that's unique to Mexicans. Um, for example, uh, I mean, I'm going to love this one. No? We have a, a, an opportunity, we have a, a, a great way of using one product and changing it to another product and, and using it for a completely different uh, thing. Marcus, we can't. Marcus, we can't see you changing the slides. Can you? Um, oh, you can. Where, where are you? Which slide are you on? We can right now see the one with the red pickup truck. Now the one uh, hours worked annually. Okay, so let's start here. So I was talking about. So there should be a red pickup truck there. No, we're on em employer enterprise uh, birth rate. Oh, so it's a slow connection. Tell me when it changes. Uh, it's, it's not changing, so maybe maybe you, you might want to just um, talk without. Now it's on the pickup truck, but you might want to think about just not using the PowerPoint and just just speak. Oh, okay. Okay. So maybe when I put it in full screen, it doesn't change. So anyway, for example, you see this one? Yeah. Okay. Three men on the pickup on the wheelbarrows. Right. So I was saying that we have this innate ability of changing the use of one product to another. Um, so I'm just showing you some examples of of Mexican creativity, or even. You know, using the product for it, what, what it was intended, like, you know, a stereo is a stereo, for example, or um, an oven is an oven, or a, an air conditioner. And even, in some cases, define loss, like, uh, you know, physical loss, or um, simply, you know, loss. Uh, in Mexico, uh, I remember very vividly when they uh, basically said that we need to wear the seatbelt and the next day everywhere in Mexico everybody was selling t-shirts with a seatbelt painted on them. So that, that to me is proof of creativity but that's not necessarily innovation. That is again a great opportunity to educate people to using this creativity to create products and services that can solve worldwide problems and not just their own personal problems. And I think that's, that's, uh, 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 that's going to be a big change when we start teaching innovation techniques at school. So what has happened in the last decade in Mexico? Uh, for starters, there's been a lot of program, I'm not going to go deep into this, but there's been a lot of programs by the Ministry of Economy, the National Council of Science and Technology, the, the Mexico's development bank, NAFINSA, that have pushed innovation and that have pushed uh, research and development, um, especially in areas like technology and biomedicine and biomedical, etc. Um, just to give you an example, in, in Mexico there were no incubators in 2003. By 2009 there were 500 incubators in universities. Mexico is that the Ministry of Economy changed uh, one of its sites, which was used to call the Undersecretary of SMBs in Mexico. It changed its name now to the 
National Entrepreneurial Institute. And uh, why that is relevant is because now we're not focusing just on creating companies, but we're focusing on creating companies that can transcend. Um, another example is that in the last 10 years, Mexico has created a, over 180 uh, industrial and technology parks. So they, they have created this great infrastructure for research and development. Um, on the culture side, every single contest, event, uh, accelerator, incubator, um, you know, all these programs have now arrived in Mexico. And uh, it's not only these programs that have arrived in Mexico, but Mexicans have created their own programs, their own incubators, their own accelerators, their own events, their own get-togethers, and it's, it's you know, it hardly a day passes that there's no uh, event where entrepreneurs can meet uh, investors or can meet design, you know, engineers, can meet designers, and that is changing the culture of Mexicans. Now students don't just think about uh, graduating and getting a job, but they think about graduating and actually creating a company and generating jobs. Another important change in Mexico. Can we wrap this up in about a minute? All right. The other one is talent. Mexico now produces a bunch of engineers. More engineers than anybody in the world per capita. And it's not just engineers. We produce the creative class in Mexico is growing really fast. Uh, the image of Mexico has changed. You're talking about the new China, the Aztec Tiger, the next Steve Jobs, the rise of Mexico. So the image of Mexico outside is changing. And finally, let me just put this chart. Uh, I, I hope it changes. But there were two funds in 2008, and I'm sorry I cannot put it in a big screen, but 14 funds in 2012 and 60 funds in 2015. So the amount of capital is exploding in Mexico, and with that, entrepreneurship is exploding. So that's that's my take on the Mexican ecosystem. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Marcus. If you have questions, Marcus, you just submit it through the platform. We use the innovation MX. Marcus, I'm going to take the prerogative as the as the moderator and ask you the first question, which is, you know, there's obviously a lot of new funds that are in Mexico, and this is this is great. But how does the resources that are now available for uh, innovators for entrepreneurs match up with what's actually needed on the ground? Well, I, I think that, you know, this is a, a learning process and a learning curve, and I don't think that they necessarily match today, uh, but I think that they will. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, as risk, risk adversion uh, lowers in Mexico, as, as failure uh, it starts to be tolerated, as more people get into the game, uh, and and as we generate success stories, there'll be a better match. Okay, and there's a question coming in from uh, Twitter from David, who's asking about what if there's specific characteristics or personality traits uh, that you look for in an entrepreneur that you want to that you're looking to invest in. Me, I mean personally, I look for somebody that listens, that is not you know stubborn that is optimistic, that has a uh, capacity to improvise, which in Mexico is very important, and that is, uh, you know, that tries to really make things happen, make, make things happen, somebody that can make things happen. And another, is another question here from, from Alex. Is there innovation without entrepreneurship? Is that possible? Uh, yes, of course, of course. I mean, one, one of the ways I, I don't think that there is innovation if the product is not adopted in the market and if the product doesn't reach society. But I do think, because to me innovation is not about invention, it's about adoption. But there is innovation that doesn't necessarily have to make you a millionaire. That, that's a problem. All right, thanks, Marcus. I'm sure there's more questions. We can save those questions for Marcus for the end. But I want to now... Um, have two 
uh, very well-known uh, innovators share their personal stories, and that's Pablo Salazar and Hugo Moreno, uh, who are uh, joining us and have um, achieved incredible innovation in the healthcare sector specifically. Uh, we'll start with Pablo, and Pablo is a managing partner at NX NXTP Labs, which is the most active acceleration and early stage fund in Latin America. Um, previously, he was Pablo was previously a co-founder at, at Naranya, if I'm pronouncing that right, Pablo, Ventures, and a principal at Ignia Partners, which is, as many of you know, the world's biggest impact investment fund. Um, he's also a board member at, at, uh, at Fagro, Verde Verdad, Provive, Doc Solutions, uh, active member of Endeavor, uh, along with many other things uh, in his background. So, uh, Paul, if you can start and um, speak for about 10 minutes uh, or, or however much, to, if you need less than that as well, and then we'll turn over to Hugo after that. Hi, everyone. How are you? And uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, hello to Hugo and Marcus. It's a pleasure to share with you this conversation. Um, well, uh, if the, main, the main question was uh, before, what, what is innovation for us? Um, I am, as you, as you know, on the, on the funding side, on the investor side in this entrepreneurial ecosystem. And the, the uh, definition that we use is the one that we got from businessdictionary.com, so hopefully it's, it's, it's right. But, and the definition for us is the process of translating uh, an idea or invention into a good or service that creates value for which customers will pay. And that definition for us has different components that are important. First of all, it's a process, so it's not something that just happens um, from one moment to another. It's not a picture, it's a, it's a, it's a movie. Um, and, 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 and it's a process to transform an idea uh, normally comes from an entrepreneur or it can, as, as, as Marcus was saying, come from other sources, uh, people that, that, that are currently working for big corporations, people at governments, people at NGOs. So the source can be, uh, again, an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur or anyone, else, any, anyone can innovate. We constantly innovate in our lives and in our businesses. But then it comes the interesting part that, 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 that really innovation uh, to be uh, transcendent it has to create value, and that value can uh, and, 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 and must be um, perceived by someone as something valuable, and someone uh, must be able and, and, and should be able to pay for it and, and, and willing to pay for it. Uh, so for us, when, when this cycle is closed in terms of having the idea. That, that finds a, a market that fulfills a need, that creates value and someone pays for it, then for us it's a relevant uh, innovation. And we have been working in the last four years uh, trying to find those innovators in Latin America and provide them with uh, capital, knowledge and, and connections. That's what the funds do. So what we do is the, we do open programs in Latin America in, in four cities where we uh, have uh, open invitations for entrepreneurs, they apply to our programs, and then we invest on them uh, a minimum of $25,000, they come to our programs, they stay with us uh, between four and six months, and we, in, within that program, we provide them with the tools to improve their businesses or ideas, and to prepare themselves to be funded. As you know, and again, we go back to the process of innovation, innovation needs funding in different stages, so we are located at the very initial stage when, when we provide the seed money that this need. We have a, a fund on top of our acceleration program that helps us to be able to follow on on those companies that that uh, start providing uh, the value that someone is willing to pay for and that start developing interesting innovations and products and services. And we normally co-invest with other funds or angel investors uh, on those companies up to one million dollars. Um, and so far, we have done 160 investments. Of those 160, we have followed on, on more than 60 now. And some of those companies are really making uh, making it big now. Uh, some of them are valued over 100 million dollars uh, on, on on the latest uh, uh, funding rounds. So you see ideas or innovations that start from from scratch, and a couple of years later, they are uh, producing value for, as I said, over $100 million, at least on the investor's uh, perspective. Um, as you can imagine, we have investments in, in many verticals, many industries, from agriculture to satellites. Uh, so we have seen many, many uh, uh, 
uh, innovators create things in different industries, and that's fascinating. Latin America and Mexico, as you know, is very uh, diverse. So uh, we have seen innovators in almost every field that you can imagine, finance, human resources, um, advertising, entertainment, etc. Um, we believe that Latin America and Mexico are today in a very special moment in terms of innovation because as Marcos said, uh, the entrepreneurs or people who innovate today do have access to resources that were not there before. They have access to people willing to help them through mentorship. They have access to capital. They have access to markets. Corporations are now jumping in on this innovation wagon and opening their doors on, on open innovation uh, strategies in order to help them to, to um, consume the products that uh, innovators are creating. Universities are finally aligning with the with the with the with the with the movement with the innovation movement, and government. Government has been very active in terms of creating programs and platforms for these entrepreneurs to 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 succeed. Um, and what we have seen lately is a is a virtual cycle where innovators that make it, like Marcus, for example, then come back to the ecosystem and give back. And that is a phenomenon that we didn't have before in Mexico or Latin America, and that's creating a, a big change because now successful and, and experienced entrepreneurs come back to the to the ecosystem and give not only money but mostly experience to new people. So there now is there, now there is a short uh, a shortcut for people who want to innovate because they receive direct uh, uh, mentoring for people that that have made it before. Uh, we have seen things in Mexico in the last couple of months that were not we we, we didn't see before. For example, family offices, which is a very traditional source of um, capital, investing on, on uh, entrepreneurial ventures uh, funded by, by previously by other funds. So um, I agree with, with what Marcus said. We are in a very, very special moment. This is a great way. This is a great moment to, to, to start uh, a business. But this is also a great moment to invest on a business. So what I believe the challenge today is that we need to balance the ecosystem and uh, be able to provide the funding and the connections and the knowledge to these new entrepreneurs that are coming and help them to be successful. Great. Th thanks, thanks, Pablo. I, ha I have a, a great presentation. I have a bunch of questions for you. I know that our people who are watching this do as well because we've been getting questions by Twitter. Um, but before going to questions, I want to uh, uh, turn over to Hugo Moreno. Uh, Hugo, Hugo founded Verde de Verdad three years ago. It's an incredibly innovative business model, which provides low-cost eyeglasses uh, to Mexico's most needy. Um, it offers free exam eye exams, and there are currently 19 shops, um, uh, according, if my numbers are correct, Hugo, uh, across the country. Uh, Hugo has a BS in civil engineering from uh, the Instituto Tecnologico de Estudios Superiores de Monterrey, and uh, he has an MBA as well. So. Uh, Hugo, I'll turn it over to you to explain your personal story and, and the idea behind your innovation and, and how you got started. Thank you, Jason. How are you? Well, uh, what, what we do is we sell uh, prescription glasses starting at uh, 14 US dollars. Uh, we have now, we opened yesterday our store number 26, so uh, we, we have 26 stores right now. And in March 2011, I was giving a conference at Harvard Business School, and it was a very special day for me because it was my last, last day as the CEO of Salud Digna, a nonprofit that offers healthcare services for uh, really low income people in Mexico. And I ran this institution for four years. I did a really successful transformation. And one of the things I did in Salud Digna was uh, introducing prescription glasses at a really, really low price. I figured out uh, lenses come in different prescriptions in a round shape like this. So I figured out that if we bought, bought some machines to scan the frames and then cut the lenses, we could have a, a complete set of, of lenses uh, for our cost, uh, lower than $2 uh, cost for us. This costs like $1 and the frame cost $1. So with this, we, we went from being no one uh, to be uh, 
the second provider of eyeglasses in Mexico. Um, we, we were doing uh, 280,000 pair of glasses uh, per year when the leader in Mexico does uh, 500,000. So I figured out there was a really important uh, market in Mexico that wasn't, uh, wasn't being attended. When I was giving this conference at Harvard Business School, uh, I, I mentioned that it was my last day uh, at Salud Digna. And after the conference, I knew Michael Chu. Uh, Michael is a professor at Harvard Business School, and he's a guru of doing business at the base of the pyramid. So I, uh, Michael asked me, uh, what are you going to do next? And I, I talked to him about my, my project, about, about the idea of um, starting, the, uh, starting a low-cost optical chain in Mexico. I, thought, I told him that my dream was to make, the, to, my dream was to make a, a comp, a, the, the larger, uh, do you hear me? Okay, I, I told him that um, my, my dream was to, uh, to make the first low cost of the chain in Mexico that attended uh, one million uh, people uh, per year. Um, so uh, my class me for my, uh, asked me, uh, told me that he was going to be in Mexico, this was uh, on Thursday, he told me I will be next, uh, next, uh, Next Tuesday in Mexico, what are you going to do? I would like to see your business plan. I didn't have a business plan. I just had the idea on my mind. So I came back from Boston to Mexico, doing my business plan on my on on the plane. Uh, I presented the business plan to Michael. He introduced me to Ignia, uh, and at the first day, Ignia told me uh, that they didn't invest on the startups. This was in March 2011. By October 2011, they invested on, on us at $3 million to start our company. We opened our first store uh, one and a half months uh, after that, after the investment. And we soon realized that the market that we were talking about was there, it was really there. Uh, some people think that the uh, low cost is selling at a lower price, and it's not just selling at a lower price. To be successful in the low cost market, you need to make the market bigger. Right now, 53% of the people we attend in Berle Verdad is people that are not using glasses, prescription glasses, and they don't use glasses because two main things. For, uh, one is because they cannot afford to pay for a pair of glasses, and another is because they don't know they need glasses. So that's why we give uh, pre-eye examination. That way many people, uh, many people uh, can realize if they, if they need glasses or not. In Mexico currently, 15 million pair of glasses are sold annually. But the potential market, if you cross, if you cross information with the United States or Chile, uh, the potential market is about 26 million. So there is 11 million pair of glasses that no one is selling in Mexico. That's a huge opportunity in, in our, in our uh, business. Uh, right now, as I said, we have 26 stores. Uh, we have 120 people working uh, with us. We are in five different, different cities. All our stores are EBITDA positive. We have a really good model right now that creates creates a huge uh, social impact, and that, and that is also uh, really profitable. Um, uh, last, just uh, last month, we raised uh, the, the, the funds or the capital needed. We went for a second round of capital. We, we raised uh, last month the funds or the capital needed to open 300 stores. So right now for us, money won't be the restriction. And I, what, I, what I tell my team is, if money is not the restriction anymore, what is the restriction? And I believe the restriction is, is enough on what we are capable of, of achieving. 
and what we are capable of, uh, capable of, of, of doing. So I think uh, this is this has been a really successful uh, story, and we are constructing a really successful story. Also, our dream from the beginning was to build a larger, uh, larger retail chain. Uh, optical retail in, in, in Mexico, not because of the number of branches, but because of the people we will, we will uh, attend. Um, I think uh, one of the things I, I've learned uh, through this uh, journey is that success success can be designed. You just have to you, you just have to start from the end. Figure out how you want that end to be, and then come to a present, and then you will have a clear idea of where where do you want uh, to go. I think in Mexico we are living right now in a country of two, uh, really uh, a lot of opportunities. There is money out there uh, ready to invest in projects like like us, and uh, you just have to have a really good model, business model. That has the, the market. You have to to have the uh, capacity to to execute that model, to scale it, and also the trust you give to investors is really really important. Uh, working with investors has been challenging, and I've been learning to work with with, with investors and investors. And it's not the money because of the money. It's also you have to uh, choose really really well who are you going to partner with. And uh, in our case, I've been really uh, uh, lucky at this. We have really good investors from our first round of capital, and then and right now with our second round of capital, we're really happy with the investors we have because they they are part of what we uh, have achieved. Not only because the money, but also because the, the they are really clever people and what they have put on on our on our on our company. One of the things I, I always... Hugo, Hugo we have another minute if you want to wrap up in about a minute. Okay. Uh, uh, I just said, uh, many people say that our business is really... Uh, can, uh, many people may copy it. I always compare our business to a restaurant. Any, everyone maybe here that is watching us has put a restaurant. We can lease a space. We can hire a chef. But... Uh, uh, making that restaurant successful and then moving to a large location or putting a second branch and making that other branch successful and then maybe going to another city and have and make that model successful that's the magic that it's it's on us uh, and that not everyone can well, th th Hugo, first, thank you and thank you. I mean, congratulations on the excellent work. I mean, I think it's just incredibly impressive. Uh, how you saw this opportunity to really uh, bring you know millions and millions of people um, who couldn't couldn't probably see the computer screen or see uh, the bus stop or, or whatnot to be able to have that type of access. So congratulations. I have a bunch of questions. We've also gotten uh, uh, many questions over Twitter, uh, Pablo, while you were speaking, and Hugo, while you were speaking. I'm going to take my prerogative as the moderator to ask the first question. Um, and I think Hugo, I think the first. I have a couple questions for you, but I think one is you mentioned how working with investors can be challenging and how it's so important to pick the right investors, right? Because investors, in many ways, become your mentors as well. So, how did you, what was your process? How did you go about choosing, you know, which which investors to work with? Did you? What was your selection criteria? Well, uh, I, I had the chance to to choose the first time and the second time. I have the chance to choose uh, for for two times. And I think that uh, the first thing that I do too is the feeling you have, and this is not something. This is something you feel. Do I fit with that, this person, or I don't fit with this person? So I think the first thing is is feeling and uh, knowing that you will do something with someone that is better than doing some things. Not not in the core business. But I, I, for example, the strategy or something that is better than doing in, in some other things that will help you. Doing, doing things with people that are better than you is really great. And Hugo, or Pablo, I think one of the things that uh, Pablo you mentioned during your presentation 
which I find very interesting is this new phenomenon in Mexico where innovators are coming back into the ecosystem um, that really that really didn't didn't happen before. What what, what do you see? What was the, the transformation that, that, that has allowed that to start to happen? What is, has there been some type of, of change in psyche, or is it more just because there are more innovators, more are naturally entering back into the ecosystem? No, I think there have been a couple of um, uh, things that have helped a lot. Uh, for example, Endeavor has been operating in Mexico for the last 10 years, and for me that has been fu fundamental on creating a mentorship culture that it might not uh, have existed before. Uh, for example, Hugo is, is, is an Endeavor entrepreneur, but he's also a mentor within the network. And uh, we have seen many of our friends uh, coming from, from uh, Endeavor and, and then giving back to society. In my experience, uh, a couple of years ago, when we started Naranja Ventures, uh, I started it actually with an Endeavor entrepreneur. And uh, we were um, challenged by Endeavor to, to see if we could start a, a, a funding a vehicle in Mexico, a fund um, with uh, a, a successful entrepreneur, in this case Arturo Galvan from Naranja, and it was very useful to 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 do that. In our case at NextEP Labs, for example, uh, we are five partners. It's four Argentinians and myself. But from the four Argentinians, the, uh, all of us are uh, all of them are entrepreneurs. And two of them are endeavor entrepreneurs. Myself, I've been an entrepreneur for a couple of times. Not a successful one, but I've been an entrepreneur. Uh, and and uh, now we are back on the on the funding side and on the mentorship side and trying to be intermediaries between um, the the investors the, and and the entrepreneurs. Uh, Marcos, there's a question for you here from uh, Arturo, uh, which is about the mortality the mortality rate for startups in Mexico. Is almost twice as that in the U.S. before reaching five years. What's, what's what are the, some of the principal causes for this? Well, the first one is that you know most of the companies in Mexico are not well planned. We, we there's a difference between creating companies and creating you know entrepreneurial companies, uh, and this is very recent in Mexico. Um, but I, you know. The, the, the mortality rate of entrepreneurial companies anywhere, including Silicon Valley, is around 90%. So I, I don't know how we can double that. Uh, I, I do think, however, that in Mexico it should be a little bit lower because there's less competition and there's more problems to be solved. So we should shoot for somewhere under that 90%. Okay. And, and, then, and then there's, a, I think, another question kind of related to somewhat related to this, but um, you know the um, public policies that, that that exist, and you know that that's you know that you know what are some of the policies in place that can boost innovation and entrepreneurship? What are some of the things that that are working well in Mexico? Because Mexico is doing a lot of things that are working very well at the at the federal level um, and at the state level as well. I mean, the state of Jalisco, for example, right? But, but there are so, still, you know, um, so many impediments. So, can you talk a little bit, um, maybe Marcus or or uh, or Pablo as or, as well, or maybe both of you, about what you see as some of the pol public policies that are working well, and if you had a uh, if you had your wish of one or two additional things that can be done at a federal state level, what would those be? Um, and this this question, the basis of this question, comes from uh, Douglas. Okay. So, you want to go back? Yes, you start you, okay, perfect. Um, we have seen many programs that, that are working on the federal level. As uh, Marcus mentioned, uh, on, 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 the, on the first week of the new presidency, they, create, they launched the National Entrepreneurship uh, Institute, and that institute has developed uh, hundreds of uh, programs, and they have opened uh, hundreds of um, uh, of uh, processes in order for entrepreneurs, funds, or other entities to receive funding or help or promotion. Uh, they have done very well in the promotion side. For example, now they organized uh, events like the National Entrepreneurship Week. The Startup Nations just happened in Mexico because they brought it. Um, and they have been very involved in the international events and, 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 and again, uh, promoting Mexico as a, as a destination for entrepreneurs and investors. Uh, but there are also the programs. Uh, for example, we are uh, now 
co-investing with the government. We, we applied to one of the programs and we received a $3 million co-investment agreement with the government. So we put $3 million in Mexico and they put $3 million. And that's very significant. And uh, they, they become our, our uh, uh, limited partners in the fund. Uh, they expect return, so it's not money that they are giving away, but they expect a limited return, and then the, they share the uh, the upside with us as fund managers. And that's been promoting the creation of new funds. Uh, uh, from we, we, we went from three or four funds now to almost 30. Many of them are working. Some of them are still uh, forming. But uh, that's been very, very impressive in terms of um, providing more opportunities for funds to be created, fund managers to, to learn. And, and, and develop themselves and it has uh, expanded the offer for entrepreneurs in terms of capital and uh, Marcus knows other other examples Marcus I mean look the, the, the government has created a lot of programs now and, and, and they have been working and they have been pushing there's there's a lot of uh, networking now and a lot of uh, talks with academics and the academy is now getting into the to the entrepreneurship cycle. Um, what, what's really, what we are missing, uh, in my opinion, is a couple of things. I think that we need the industry to participate in this. And very seldom uh, does the industry really participate in the ecosystem. So we, we are short one leg. But this has to be about academy, uh, you know, industry and government. And in Mexico, industry is not very active in mergers and acquisitions. And, uh, you know, we still have a lot of monopolies. And uh, they they are not very active in the entrepreneurial community. And this is one thing we're trying to bring to the table. Um, talking about my wishes, let, let me give you an, a very good example of a policy that worked very well in Mexico. And I think that they should repeat it on the entrepreneurial side. A couple of years ago, you know, 10, 20 years ago, the Mexican film industry existed. And there was an article that came out in the fiscal law that was Article 186. Now it's Article 186, originally it was 226. And basically it allows companies to deduct 100% of uh, whatever they invest in a movie out of their, the money that they owe to taxes. Uh, and this created and spawned a movie industry in a, a very few uh, months. Now the problem with this is that movies don't necessarily generate a return. Uh, not, not everybody watches Mexican movies and you know there's not a big audience. But imagine if they would do this law, and this is what we're talking to the government now, where they allow corporations deduct 100% of what they invest in entrepreneurs or in funds that will invest in entrepreneurs. And this will get the industry in the ecosystem and this will multiply the money available by, you know, many, many times. Thanks. Uh, Hugo, a question for you about your particular story. And what that question is, you know, you, you know, you, you, you're able to provide these eyeglasses at such a low cost. Um, so one is, how are you able to do that at such a low cost? And what were the, why didn't, why didn't anyone do this before you? Um, are there structural uh, impediments? Um, and, uh, and just kind of in the interest of time, just to tie that together with a question from Sebastian as well, which is, you know, what guarantees as well the innovation benefits uh, low-income individuals, especially those in the informal sector? So. Um, I think your, 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 your case, Hugo, is one in which you really are aimed at low-income individuals, but how do, you, how do you really reach those low-income individuals, especially those in the informal sector? And then, you know, the other question that I got was, uh, was how are you able to do this when, when others, what were some of the impediments why others maybe hadn't been able to do this before? Okay. Well, uh, the optical industry is a transforming industry. It's, it's, uh, since a uh, Chinese product is available in the world, uh, the, the cost of making a frame or the cost of making the glasses is a fraction of what it was uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago. So it's the, the, the cost uh, from uh, since the introduction of Chinese products, costs have dropped. And also, we realize that if we skip the process of 
uh, taking our glasses to a third party shop and we did it ourselves, we could drop our costs in a really significant uh, way. These were just like the two things we, we, uh, we realized. But it's not only uh, selling at a, uh, at a lower price, because many people think that low prices, oh, try to cost your prices. Because if you sell at a lower price, you, you will also have a lower margin per length per uh, unit sold. So what you need to do is sell, uh, sell more volume in order to be self-sustainable. So what we do, the, the huge opportunity here uh, in, in our market is the people that are not using glasses right now. That's the way we are able to do, uh, to make this market uh, uh, bigger. And what we do is we, uh, location is really, really important for us. We are in downtown, uh, our stores are located in downtown. The, the, the walking traffic is uh, more than a thousand uh, people per hour outside our stores. So there's a, a, huge, a huge amount of people walking uh, outside our stores. You look at one of our stores and you will see some eye, uh, some tests, uh, vision tests, so you can realize if you need or, or don't need glasses. That's the way we, we get uh, um, uh, our customers. Well, so you're literally just walking down the street and you can do your own test and see if you need to come into the store. Yes. We, we, we tell you, we put some steps on the floor and we said, if you can see here, okay, you're okay. If you cannot see, please come inside because you might have a problem. And there's a huge uh, people every day that are coming, uh, walking. 50% uh, of the people uh, that we get into our stores is because they, they saw the vision test and they, uh, they were not, uh, uh, their vision was not clear, they come to our store. That's very cool. Another another question, and I think this is probably a question is uh, particularly relevant given all of the people who are on this um, Google Hangouts. Um, but it's a question about th th there's a, a feeling from Cassandra that innovation is very male dominated. Um, so I guess you know there's there's there are four males on this uh, on this Hangout, and um, what are what are the, the what are the thoughts? How, how uh, how, 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 what type of gender balance really does e exist insofar as innovators? Um, you know, maybe um, Pablo and Marcus, you can address this from a from a uh, from an entrepreneurship and investment perspective. And Hugo, maybe is, is, is address this from your perspective as well. Maybe Pablo, do you want to you want to start off? Yeah, I think it's a sad reality that uh, as in many other. Uh, sectors in the world, or most of the sectors, the, the gender parity is not as it should be. It should be 50-50 as just the world is. Uh, but uh, I do believe that the, that the trend and the, and the trajectory is correct. And uh, we have seen in our portfolio, for, for we have almost 400 founders in terms of the teams, and uh, we have around 30% of them are women, and they are very good, they're, they're, they're very good companies as, as the other ones. And we've been pushing the women participation through a platform that we have called We Exchange with the Inter American Development Bank. Uh, but I think it's a matter of time, and it's a short time that 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 they will be represented as they should be. There's a lot of initiatives, like Victoria 147 in Mexico or Epic Queen, also working on, on integrating women to 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 the entrepreneurial and, and, and uh, world. On the funding side, it's it's the same. It's underrepresented, sadly, but we are working hard. We have one female partner, and hopefully we have more in the in the future. And many funds are now uh, very conscious about uh, becoming uh, gender balanced. Marcus, Hugo, do you want to add anything else? I think a great example uh, is no, sir. Go ahead, go ahead. I think a great example is Endeavor. Endeavor was submitted by a woman, and it's run in Mexico by a woman also. Uh, so uh, I think there's there's opportunity for both, and, and women are doing a great job in this. It's not only from, from us. Marcus? I mean, I, but this is about empowering women and about them being empowered. And the trend is that they are feeling more empowered every year, and the trend is coming. We ourselves 
our holding company we created more than half of women in them, and about a quarter are actually led by women. So I'm not worried about women participation. It's happening that will grow. What one of the so that kind of leads to another question from Anna, which is uh, about creating those creating innovators moving forward, and is how can we create young innovators that there are you know universities are you know having increasingly implementing programs designed to spark greater innovation, but should we really be starting these programs before university, um, at the secondary school level, or even outside of the formal schools uh, situation? Are there other things that can be done? And the broader society to really um, create this 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 culture of innovation and this sense of, of being able to, to to find problems or challenges in society and come on your own with a solution to some of those challenges. So I mean, a question, a question on, yeah, a question on how early should we be starting and what what more could be done to foster more young innovators? We, we, without a doubt, we have to start uh, as early as we can. Yeah. Actually, education needs to change. We, we no longer give data to people in, in because the data you have on your account. I mean, you have you don't need to remember data. Or people. They're, they're they're accessible. To people. What we need to be talking people is how to solve problems, how to spot problems, ideate them, and how to search for solutions. And uh, and those all those things are part of the innovation problem. And the innovation techniques and the innovation education, and I think that's that is where education should go, and it definitely needs to go there in Mexico and in most emerging markets Pablo, as early as it can. Yeah, Pablo, yeah. You, have you seen anything that's working well? Yes, we have seen many many initiatives. Uh, again, going back to Epic Queen, working with little girls, uh, teaching them how to code. We have seen many initiatives working in Mexico in the robotics side. Uh, both private and, and government uh, sponsored. Um, we have seen in the schools, pro after school uh, programs, working very well in terms of um, uh, helping people to think uh, uh, innovatively. Innovation is a lot about leadership and self awareness, and schools are working on that. Uh, I agree with Marcus, there is a lot still to be done. And also, not only provide them the culture, but the tools. 